run up here, obviously. And there is a KDE in the way, on the way up here. So I hope you enjoyed your lunch and are ready for the next presentation. Nico is uh, painfully aware that you are all digesting now and uh, that he needs to jump a bit extra around. But I actually trust that he will be able to jump a bit extra around on the stage because let me just tell you about it. the very first time I met Nico, I think. That was uh, in a karaoke bar in, uh, at a company meeting. And somebody sitting over there pushed me on stage to sing Barbie Girl from Aqua. Anybody interested in hearing that now? Should we wait to the party tonight? <laughs> I already see the audio guy sitting at the back. They're like, no! So uh, I was pushed at stage to sing Barbie Girl, and Nico actually joined me, if willing less, I don't know. Anyway, he is uh, as brave as me, half my age, half my size, <laughs> but uh, at least twice as clever as me. So please welcome on stage Nico Fella from KD. Thank you, Jasper, for the introduction. So let's talk about KDE. So some of you may wonder now, what is this KDE thing that he's going to talk about? And if you open up any KDE application, it will have a menu item in the menu bar that says about KDE. And when you click on that, you get greeted by this nice dragon and this dialogue, which reads, KDE is a worldwide community of software engineers, artists, writers, translators, and creators who are committed to free software development. KDE produces the Plasma desktop environment. That's the thing that people usually mean when they say they use KDE. Hundreds of applications, popular examples would be Krita, which is a digital painting application, and Kden Live, which is a video editor, and the many software libraries that support them. KDE is a cooperative enterprise. No single entity controls its direction or products. Instead, we work together to achieve the common goal of creating the world's finest free software. Everyone is welcome to join and contribute to KDE, including you. Now that we figured out what this KDE thing is, the question is, why am I talking about it on a Qt conference? Qt and KDE have a lot of shared history because all of KDE software is based on Qt, currently on Qt 5. But some of KDE's code date back way to the KDE's beginnings in 1996, where it was written against Qt 1 and has ported across all major versions since. And we're here to talk about the next iteration of that. Ever since it has been possible under the open governance model, KDE have people have contributed a lot of code and fixes to Qt itself. So many of the things we take for granted in modern Qt actually come from KDE people. And it was mentioned earlier today already, KDE is very relevant for anyone who's using open source Qt because the KDE Free Qt Foundation was built to ensure that Qt stays available as an open source project. A little bit about me. Hi, I'm Nico. I've been a KDE developer for about five years now which, from my perspective, is quite a long time. But then again, there's probably people here in this room that have been writing KDE software since even before I was born. I've done a lot of things in KDE in the last five years, mostly working on Plasma, on various applications, but also on the foundational building blocks. So if you've used any KDE software and recently, there's a good chance that I've touched it at some point somehow. I've also um, been contributing to Qt occasionally, and I'm one of the main people involved in getting KDE towards Qt 6. Now, the next question is, why am I giving this talk? The short answer to that is because my colleagues at KDE asked me to do it. <laughs> the slightly longer answer is, I want to answer the question of, does KDE use Qt 6 yet? And also answer the logical follow-up to that, why not? I want to share the approach that we have taken towards working, uh, for working towards Qt 6 and our experience with it, and I hope that by sharing our experience, 
you can learn from it and apply this experience to your own porting project. Before we talk specifics about porting KDE towards Qt6, we need to talk a little bit about KDE's code base in general. KDE has a lot of code. Last time I checked, it was about 15 million lines of code. Most of it is C++. Everything is based on Qt5. And there's a fairly decent amount of QML code, too. KDE is not one big monolithic thing. Rather, it consists of lots of independent sub-projects. For example, pl the Plasma team is one such sub-project, but it does not have that much to do with, uh, say, what's happening in Krita, for example. So they are fairly independent, but there's still a good amount of consistency and collaboration between the various sub-projects, and they're all based on the same foundational libraries. The code is, so to say, multi-generational in the sense that some of it dates back to way to the beginnings of KDE in 1996. So sometimes when you open a file and at the top the copyright header says, copyright 1996, Matthias Kalle Dahlheimer, and any time you see that name coming up in KDE, you know the code is really old. <laughs> What's also interesting from a, say, community point of view is that code changed maintainerships a couple of times. So quite often people start working on KDE stuff in their free time when they're a student for a couple of years, and then they move on in life, they get married, they get kids, they lose interest, they move on to other projects, and usually other people will pick up the work so it doesn't get abandoned, and this kind of handover happened over three or four generations already, so apparently we're doing something right when it comes to building a community that can persist. Traditionally, of course, in KDE, everything was based on Qt widgets because there wasn't really much of an alternative. But ever since QML has been a thing, we've used Q QML in KDE. In particular, Plasma heavily makes use of QML. But more and more applications are also either ported to QML or are newly created based on QML. And I will talk a little bit about what this means for the Qt6 port later. Some of the applications that we have are rather, say, graphics intensive in the sense that they do a lot of custom low-level rendering code, mostly using OpenGL. For example, uh, Quinn, our window manager and Wayland compositor, does a lot of low-level graphics and painting code for the uh, compositing and actually getting stuff on your display. And apps like Krita, the painting program, obviously does a lot of custom uh, painting stuff. And since more than 10 years ago, I think KDE has used CMake as its build system. Back then, we were still using auto tools, so we never really used QMake for anything in KDE. I've mentioned that there are some foundational building blocks that all KDE projects are based on, and these are the KDE frameworks. These are 80-something libraries, uh, all based on top of Qt5 and some optional system libraries. And uh, in the before times, uh, when KDE was still based on Qt4, this was one rather large monolithic thing called KDE Libs. And in the Qt4 to Qt5 transition, we split this up into the 80-something libraries we have now which has the benefit that it makes it much easier to reuse parts of it for external users. So if you are someone working with Qt, which I assume is the case since you're at a Qt conference, then this is very interesting for you because you can reuse the libraries that KDE has created and benefit from all the solutions that we came up with. At work at KDAP, I'm also writing a, a blog post series about some of the more interesting frameworks for outside users, so make sure to check that out. Just like Qt, uh, the KDE frameworks provide a strict API and ABI stability guarantees, which is very nice for the users because you don't need to worry too much about things breaking. But of course, if you're developing the libraries itself, then this can get in the way because it limits what you can do. 
And since with Qt 6, we have a new major version of Qt coming up, this is a natural point in time to also have a new major version of these KDE frameworks, which is a like, once in a decade opportunity to break compatibility and clean up some of the things up and do the kind of change you usually can't do. This Q6 transition and transition towards KDE Framework 6 is so important for us that we even started thinking about it way before Q6 even was officially a thing. The first time we really specifically talked about it was uh, in 2019 at Academy, which is KDE's annual get-together conference. And there we had a planning session exploring some of the ideas we had for this new major version. A couple of weeks later, we met again in Berlin for the KDE Framework 6 kickoff sprint. This was at a time where people still got physically together in one room for those meetings. But back then, David Four, who is the maintainer of KDE Frameworks, so obviously a very important person to have around when talking about KDE Frameworks, couldn't make it for personal reasons. So he decided to attend the sprint virtually in form of this laptop that Volker is pointing towards the board of notes. Back then, this idea was pretty much novel and unheard of. Little did we know at the time that just a couple of months later, we would all be attending meetings like that. So during the session, we set out some design goals for this new major version of KDE Frameworks. Qt has promised that the upgrade from Qt 5 to Qt 6 should be as easy as possible. And we wanted to achieve the same because we've been a bit burned in the past with two complicated transitions that caused a lot of breakage, and we wanted to avoid that as much as possible. Uh, related to that, we wanted to delay the point in time where we actually split out the new major version and actually break things as much as possible and do as much of, as possible of the work that we need to put into it on top of the existing code base so we can have those, this work integrated and test it and release it and keep the difference between the, the five version and the six version as small as possible. Then, of course, we want to take the opportunity to, to improve our APIs. Uh, with the power of hindsight, it's easy to say this API is not ideal, it's too complex, it's unintuitive, it's unneeded, it models the wrong concept, it exposes too much implementation detail, stuff like that. Then we want to take the opportunity to drop some of the things that are rarely used or not used at all. So for example, uh, KHTML, which is the precursor of uh, modern-day Chromium, well, back in the time was, was very nice, but right now it's not really used by anything, so we want to take this opportunity and formally retire that. I've mentioned that traditionally in KDE everything was based in Qt widgets and we're moving more and more towards using QML, but some of our APIs are entangled with Qt widgets in ways that they don't have to be. For example, in a couple of places, we pass a Qt widget pointer to a function just to be able to set a parent window on something. And by replacing this Qt widget with a Qt window, we can have the same functionality in a way that is not dependent on Qt widgets, which makes the API more flexible and easier to integrate with QML-based applications. KDE started out as a Linux desktop environment, but so the focus has traditionally been on Linux a lot, but that changed a lot over time, and other platforms are getting more and more relevant. Probably we have even the most users of KDE software on Windows because Krita is very popular there. And we wanted to reflect that by improving the cross-platform support of our frameworks. Related to that, we want to, in some places, achieve a better separation between an interface to something and the implementation of this interface. 
to give you an example, on Plasma we have a system that lets applications store secrets like passwords in a way that they don't get written to a plain text file on the disk because that's a security issue. If it just gets stolen, then someone can read out all your passwords. That thing is called KWallet and it works okay-ish on Plasma, but it does have some problems on other platforms. For example, GNOME has its own solution for this called GNOME Keyring. Windows has its own native way of storing secrets like that. Mac OS has its own thing for that. Android has its own thing for that. And instead of porting KWallet to all of those platforms and have it compete with the operating system's native way of storing it, we thought it would be a much better idea to just have an interface library that transparently allows the application to use whatever system is best for the given platform so that the application doesn't need to worry about it. And this kind of pattern we, we saw in, in a couple of places and we want to address that. Uh, I've mentioned that uh, the work started out in 2019 when Qt 6 wasn't a thing yet, but that didn't mean we, there wasn't any work to do for us. We had a lot of deprecated Qt API that we needed to port away from. We wanted to make changes to our frameworks to prepare them according to the, the goals we set out. So a lot of this happened. And then once Qt 6 was actually a thing, we of course got curious about how hard is it going to be to port to Qt 6. In German, we have a saying called probieren geht über studieren, which roughly translates to trying something out is more effective than thinking about it. So that's what we did. We took a Qt 6, we threw our application against it, and saw what happened. And what we saw was, can roughly be grouped into a couple of classes of issues. The first thing you may notice when building your application against Qt 6 is that Qt 6 does not have all of the modules that Qt 5 has. This can have two reasons. Reason one is because the module was deprecated in Qt 5 and thus was removed in Qt 6. This is, for example, the case for Qt Script or Qt Quick Controls 1. So if your application or project is using that, you need to find a way to port away from that. The other case would be a module that had, has not been deprecated but hasn't been added to Qt 6 or at least to the initial release. For example, Qt Web Engine was not part of the 6.0 release and was only added in 6.2. So the first step for porting your project to Qt 6 is check which Qt modules you are using and whether they are actually available in Qt 6, and if not, you need to consider alternatives. The second class of issues that came up a lot was uh, when you build your app against Qt 6, you will notice there's a lot of includes missing. This is a problem that's as old as C++ itself. When you include uh, a file and that file includes another file and you need a class from that uh, second file, then it will just work, but then something changes and you're suddenly missing an include. That happens on almost every new Qt release, but of course with Qt 6, a lot of things changed inside Qt, so this kind of issue comes up a lot more. Fortunately, this is very easy to fix usually, and it's also very easy to apply that to the existing Qt 5 code base. Another thing you will notice is that Qt 6, Qt 6 is stricter in some regards than Qt 5, for example, because some of the implicit conversions that were present in Qt 5 are not anymore in Qt 6. To give you an example, Q shared pointer implicitly converted to Boolean in Qt 5, but doesn't anymore in Qt 6, so you need to adjust your code for that. The good thing is the solution for fixing Qt 6 usually also works in Qt 5, so you can easily apply that to your existing code base. When you're customizing, for example, a widget, you often override a, a class from Qt and implement some virtual function. And for cases like this, sometimes signatures changed. 
So your method is not actually overwriting any method anymore, and stuff will break because they added a parameter, they removed the parameter, they changed the const or stuff like that. This is very easy to catch if you're making use of the override keyword because it's designed to exactly catch this kind of issue. So I urge you to make use of it to avoid some nasty surprises. This kind of issue is not that easy to fix on top of the existing code base as the others because usually you, may, you need to make it conditional on your Qt version. So you need an hash if uh, Qt version larger, Qt version check 600 or something like that. This kind of trying it out, playing around, fixing some of the low hanging fruits went on for about a year until in late 2021, we decided we want to make this experimental thing a bit more official by adapting our build system to Qt6 in a way that also allows to build the, the same project against both Qt5 and Qt6 because we still want to do work on the Qt5 code base. When you're using Qt with CMake, you know that the major version of Qt is all over the place. In, in every target name or function name that is provided by Qt, you see stuff like Qt5 colon colon core. And that's a problem for Qt6, obviously. If your goal is just to port your stuff to Qt6 without keeping compatibility with 5, then you can just replace every five you see with a six, and it will get you like 98% there. If you, like we, want to keep compatibility with Qt5, then it gets a bit more involved. Qt5.15 added versionless variants of a lot of the CMake targets and functions, which is very nice in a lot of cases, but it's problematic when you're using it in libraries, in particular the versionless targets. Because when you link to a versionless target, this gets uh, baked into the CMake config files that you install for your consumer to pick up, which means you are leaking the versionless target into your consuming application, which can break things there. Because, for example, it prevents people from building against both Qt5 and Qt6 within the same build folder. This is not something that KDE usually does, but we know that some of our potential consumers do that, so we wanted to avoid that. The sort of worst case default solution we settled on was introducing a CMake variable, Qt major version, which is either five or six, and then wrote things like Qt variable, Qt major version, colon, colon, core, which is a bit of a mouthful, but it works well in practice. This will get you like 95% there. There's a couple of places that uh, still need manual intervention. For example, if you want to make use of the Qt5 comfort library, you need to add that CMake target to your uh, link step. And since that library is only available in Qt6, you make that conditional against the version you're building against or things like Qt X11 extras move from being its own module to being part of Qt base, so you need to adjust your linker call there. I've talked a bit about some of the smaller recurring problems that we faced. There are also some larger problems that we haven't solved entirely. One of those is Qt text codec. Your text codec is used to transcode strings from one encoding to another. So, for example, you, want, uh, you have a UTF-8 string and want to convert that to, say, Shift-JIS, which is a Japanese encoding. In Qt5, this was possible using Qt text codec, but in Qt6, that got replaced with QString converter. QString converter has the unfortunate limitation of it can only handle a handful of codecs, which are UTF-8, 16, 32, and Latin 1, and none of the 50 or so uh, language-specific encodings that QText Codec supports. 
Qt text codec is still available in the Qt5 Compat library, but of course that's not a great long-term solution to rely on a deprecated by definition module. KDE apps, at least a couple of them, need this kind of broad codec support in things like email clients or text editors because we need to be able to handle any data the user throws at the app and telling your, the, your users that they can't open their Shift.js fi encoded file anymore because the cute people decided they should be using UTF-8 is not a great solution. Fortunately, there's a solution for this on the horizon, which is adding back uh, some of the codecs that are missing to QString Converter. But as of right now, it's not quite clear yet whether this will make it into 6.4 or will be delayed to 6.5. There's also an interesting behavior change in QText stream because in Qt5, it defaults to a operating system and locale-specific codec, which in Linux usually is UTF-8, so you don't really have to worry about that. But on Windows, this is specific to your locale. In Qt6, this was changed to be UTF-8 by default. So if you're on Windows and you have a Qt5 application that is writing out data using the default codec, then you upgrade your code to Qt6, and now you're reading that same data back in using UTF-8, you might be in for a nasty surprise there. So watch out for that. Another larger area of trouble was QStringRef. QStringRef was already sort of replaced with QStringView in Qt5. However, QStringView in Qt5 is a bit limited because it's missing some of the API that you expect it to have. Some of it, like string view to integer, to double, to float, etc., were added in Qt 5.15.2, which is a bit unorthodox. And they also come with a big fat warning that says, this is not tuned for performance in Qt 5, only use this as a porting aid. But if you consider that usually when you're using something like string ref or string view, there's a good chance you care about the performance. So you need uh, to, to think about whether you want to actually use that. You can't, can't also just replace one thing one-to-one -one with the other because there are some behavior difference when it comes to a lifetime, etc. So by blindly porting one to the other, we introduced a couple of regressions, so watch out for that as well. QStringRef as a class is still available in the Qt5 Compat library, but it's not that useful to have because you, you can use the class itself, but all of the integration points in other Qt uh, API like QString, left ref, mid ref, right ref, are gone, so you can technically use the class, but you have no way to actually obtain a useful QString ref. A very similar story is QregExp. That was already sort of replaced by QRegular expression in 5.0, so you would assume that by now everything is ported to the new thing, which was certainly not the case for us. Again, QregExp is still available in the Compat library, but again, it's not that useful on its own because stuff like QString starts with uh, taking a QregExp argon. Here again, while they both do very similar things, they are a regex, there are some differences in syntax and behavior, so you can't just blindly replace one with the other. Another recurring problem we had was with various extras modules, like Qt X11 extras, Android extras, Windows extras, Mac extras. Those are all more or less gone in Qt6 in the sense that they are not standalone modules anymore. Instead, some of the functionality got merged into Qt base, 
but only as private API, which is not a good long-term solution because it doesn't come with all of the stability guarantees. So relying on those is not necessarily a good idea. There is no generic solution for this to port properly. The, the overall idea, as I understand, is to see what kind of use cases emerge and then add specialized API for this. So for example, one of the things we encountered was that we were using Qt Android Extras to request permissions from the operating system and there is a specialized permission API discussed upstream that is supposed to abstract between different operating systems and that could be a possible replacement for this. So if you encounter this in your code and you don't find a way to actually port it to something proper, then file a bug report, get, get yourself heard, and people hopefully will consider uh, your use case and add some proper API for this. An area where a lot of things changed in Qt6 is the graphics stack, and that has some impact on applications as well. In Qt5, Qt was using OpenGL for every everything related to hardware accelerated rendering, which turned out to be not a good thing, mostly because on a lot of platforms, OpenGL drivers are really, really bad. On macOS, this even goes as far as that OpenGL is officially deprecated by Apple in favor of Apple's native graphics API, which is called Metal. But of course, it's macOS specific, so if you want a cross-platform application, that's going to be very challenging. Cute so solution for that is the rendering hardware interface, which is an abstraction like we like them to do, that allows you, or at least the idea is to transparently allow you to use whatever native graphics API uh, the operating system wants, like OpenGL or Vulkan or Direct3D or Metal, without worrying about it in your application code. However, some applications uh, need to adjust for that, because for most applications it should be fine if they're not doing too much custom stuff, but if you're doing things like custom shaders or raw direct OpenGL calls, then this kind of abstraction breaks. For shader code in Qt Quick, you need to port that to a new shading language and integrate it with your build system, which is a bit of manual work, but it's doable. And if you're using OpenGL directly in your application, you might want to force the RHI backend to be OpenGL, which means that hopefully your code will continue to work. But of course, then you're not benefiting from this kind of abstraction and not getting the ideal API on all platforms. The impact this has on KDE's code base is somewhat unclear because we haven't really tried running some of the more graphics intensive apps against Qt6 yet. But what I can tell is that Krita is, in particular, is expecting some larger problems because they had this problem as well that they were using OpenGL on Windows and it was a really, really bad experience because OpenGL drivers on Windows are just bad. And their solution was to use Angle, which is a translation layer that transparently translates OpenGL to Direct3D. So they used that to make it work. But Qt6 dropped support for using Angle because you don't need it anymore in theory because there's RHI. But of course, Krita was not written against RHI, so it can't really make use of it. And it's not quite sure yet how this will look in the future. What um, I've mentioned that uh, we're using QML in quite a few of places in KDE, and we need to make some adjustments to have that working against Qt6 as well. Something that makes this complicated is that we don't have an if def in QML. In C++, we can paper over minor differences between Qt5 and Qt6 just by doing an if def. In QML, we have no such thing. 
This is a problem, for example, for acute graphical effects, which was removed as a module, but is still available in the Qt5 Compat library. However, to make use of that, you need to adjust your import paths, and there is not really a nice way, as far as I can see, to do that in a way that is both compatible with Qt5 and Qt6. So we have yet to find a good strategy for dealing with that kind of problem. In the early days of Qt6, there was a lot of talk about breaking changes to the QML language, back then a uh, code named QML3. Not much has happened in this regard, uh, as far as I can see, and I'm not quite sure about the, the exact future plans there, which makes it a bit hard for us to judge how this will impact our application code and how we can best prepare for that and in things like our API design. So a bit more public information on the exact plans and what we as application developers must expect there would be appreciated from our side. So the big question is, where are we now in terms of Qt6 porting? I would have loved to tell you that I'm running this presentation on a Plasma built against Qt6, but that's not true. First of all, because I'm not actually using my laptop for this presentation, and second of all, we haven't managed to really run a full Plasma against Qt6 yet. What I can tell you is that a number of repos already built against Qt6, and we also have a CI system in place to ensure that it keeps working. And currently, um, when I was writing this slide, there were 178 repos building against uh, Qt6 out of 690. But that number is changing pretty much daily. So I made a handy website that gives you the accurate number each day. And when I looked this morning, we were already at 182. While doing this, we did find some bugs. That's to be expected from an early adopter of Qt. We reported them, of course. A lot of them got fixed. That's how it's supposed to work, right? A lot of the work on KDE Framework 6 that is not strictly related to Qt6 is still going on. So a lot of redesigning of our APIs, cleaning that up, etc. And most of the QML porting that needs to be done still needs to be done, precisely because we don't really have a good strategy of doing it in a backwards compatible way. I've talked a lot about troubles and issues with Qt6, but that's not entirely fair, so let's talk a bit about the good things that we're looking forward to. Perhaps the most important thing that we are looking forward to with Qt6 is a version of Qt that is actually developed and maintained and released as an open source project. KDE has been always pushing the edge of what Qt can provide, and it is absolutely crucial for us that we are able to actively take part in upstream development, contribute our fixes, our features, discuss things with upstream, and having Qt as an openly developed project is absolutely critical for that. We've had quite a few cases where we found issues with Qt 5, and we're, that would need to be addressed upstream, but we can only contribute stuff to Qt6 and not Qt5 anymore. So it, it will be a long time between we contribute the things and we can actually benefit from them, which in some cases really cut our motivation to do this kind of work, which is a shame because everybody loses with that kind of approach. There are there's a lot of talk about big things in, in Qt6, but I will want to also mention that there is a lot of small things that we're looking forward to that are too tiny on their own to be mentioned in any presentation, but still make Qt6 a better product than Qt5 ever was. In particular, we're looking forward to a lot of the performance improvements that are happening in Qt6, which is especially relevant because KDE recently started an initiative around measuring and improving the energy efficiency and sustainability of our software. There's also a, a talk by one of my fellow KDE 
people on this exact topic later. We're also very much uh, looking forward to future improvements in Wayland support, because if, if you've been following um, the Linux desktop and embedded space, then Wayland is the big thing right now. And Qt6 already, or Qt already works reasonably well on Wayland, but to make it work as well as it can, there still needs to be uh, further improvements upstream. And we are, ve we are very happy to uh, drive this process, but again, we need to actually benefit from the things that we push upstream. I've mentioned that we want to achieve a better separation between uh, Qt widgets parts and Qt uh, GUI parts and core parts, and things like Qt Action being in Qt GUI instead of Qt Widgets could help a lot there, because it would allow us to write API using Qt Action that is not dependent on Qt Widgets and works nicely with both widgets and QML. Uh, earlier today, Maurice talked about a new approach to Qt Multimedia, which we welcome a lot because we have quite a lot of use cases for multimedia and KDE, ranging from simple things like being able to play a video in your chat application and, uh, to fully-fledged media players. And time and again, it has shown that using Qt Multimedia is nice in theory, but it leads to very fragmented and inconsistent support across different operating systems. And we're very much looking forward to the new Qt Multimedia and in particular the FFmpeg-based backend to see if that uh, will improve things in this regard. And we're also looking forward to everything that's happening in QML and Qt Quick, in particular all the improvements around performance and tooling in QML. And we're hoping that uh, we will see future improvements on making Qt Quick and Qt Quick controls feel a bit more at home on the desktop side. In conclusion, I can say we've had some challenges going to Qt 6. We're still having some unresolved challenges, but overall the experience has been all right. It definitely, if you compare it to uh, transitions in the past, like Qt 3 to 4 or 4 to 5, Personally, I haven't been around there then, but from what I've heard from fellow developers, things are a lot better now than they used to be back then. So as far as I'm concerned, it's safe to say that Qt's promise of an easy upgrade from 5 to 6 was not a lie. If our goal would have been to port to Qt 6 and get it released as fast as possible, we would probably already be done but that's not what we wanted to do, because we rather wanted to take the time, do things properly, improve our own APIs in the process, so that slowed down the progress on that a bit. So it probably still will be some time before we see KDE software released against Qt6. But uh, as a last uh, sentence, I will just say I'm very much looking forward to the future, to working with and on Qt6. And with that, I thank you for your attention, and I will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. There is a question down there. That was the guy that was delegated to before. So. Yeah, I can comment a bit on the uh, QML stuff. Um, uh, first, if you, uh, the, the stuff with uh, graphical effects and um, it's having different names and versions in uh, Qt5 and Qt6, uh, you can address that by using uh, the import statements in QML dir files. Basically, you make your own wrapper module and in the QML dir file, depending on if you're built with um, Qt5 or Qt6, you import one or the other. Okay. And um, okay. there are a few quirks with that in Qt5, but uh, if that's a recurring topic, you can make your template module and have another type in there because that's necessary. And yeah, like that, I've written that down in some ticket. I that can. Sounds like for you. a good thing. I will yeah. make a mental note on that. So yeah. thank you for that. 
and about breaking changes in QML, I don't intend to uh, uh, make any uh, heart-breaking changes for um, uh, compilability to C++, but um, uh, certain things just won't compile to C++ then. So the main topic is we need to see all your types ahead of time. Like you have to register your C++ types um, uh, declaratively, you have to use Qt at QML module, um, uh, and to uh, show us your QML types. You have to annotate your JavaScript functions with types, and um, you can like figure that all, all that out by using QML lint um, uh, on your uh, QML code to see if uh, this could be compiled to C++. Yeah, so and if, if it can't, then you can still use QML, but it will just be slower and um, I'm not making any guarantees about Qt7. <laughs> uh, one of the areas where stuff like this came up was uh, context properties were one of those things that were supposed yeah. to break. Yeah. Yeah. And in a couple of places, we sort of have context properties as a sort of API. So that, that's one of the things where we said, OK, we probably need to find a replacement for this, because this is going to break. Well, you can still use context properties. Just uh, the code that uses context properties won't be compiled to C++. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but that's, um, yeah. Uh, reasons like that is why we want to know about those things so we can include them in our API decisions instead mm -hmm. of just finalizing an API now and then later find out that it is, it is problematic. Yeah, the rule of thumb is if we can see it at compile time, it's good. If we can't see it at compile time, it's bad. Okay. <laughs> that was amazing. You just got a promise there there's not going to be any heartbreaking changes. I wish my wife would give me such. <laughs> any other questions? Yeah. Where's our runner? We only have one microphone. We just have one microphone. Thank you. First of all, thanks for the, the heads up uh, regarding the migration. So. Uh, from, from what I understood, you had like a head-first approach regarding the migration. And uh, the question is, if it is so, would you approach it differently uh, now, after you've seen everything uh, and how it went in the project? I, f I think our approach wa was pretty good, because it uh, allowed us to just play, pr play around and, and see what happens. So I don't see any reason to do anything different. So one of, the, one of the things that made you kind of special is that you wanted to maintain a Qt5 and a Qt6 in the same code base. Yes. If I had an application on my own, I'm sure a lot of people out here has Qt5 application, they're considering upgrading to Qt6. And they didn't have the need for a very long tail of Qt5 with it. How, how much easier would it be for you had you just been able to say all new development stops today Everybody focus on the Qt6. Um, if, if you have an application that you, or a code base that you fully control and have relatively easy time to get to Qt6, that's, that's a very good approach. One of the reasons we chose to take the different approach of keeping compatibility is when we want to make a, a lot of changes that were not, were not strictly, strictly related to Qt6, like cleaning up the frameworks, and that just takes a lot of time. And we also don't fully control all of the release cycles of the various consuming projects of KDE frameworks. So we have different applications that release at different times, and some of them have a harder time to port to Qt6 than others, and we simply have too many applications to, uh, to port them all to Qt6 at the same time. So at least for the frameworks, we want to maintain a five version for the foreseeable future. And I would expect that it will take years for us to port the last applications to Qt6, even if the first one will be very soon. Yeah. Other questions? Well, I have more, one more then. Sure. When we help our customers in KDAP with migrating from, say, Motif to Qt, we tell them, be super careful. 
only do one change at a time, migrate, and later on you can go and mess with the APIs and fix up the things you don't like and so on. You seem to not be listening to us in, in that <laughs> sense. How much of the pain that you inflicted was because that you wanted to go both Qt6 and upgrade KD at the same time? Uh, it, it does cause a bit of pain because if we would not do that, we would be able to do things like release a KDE Frameworks 5 built against Qt6 right now. We, we would be possible, it would be possible to do that and instead later on uh, further iterate towards a breaking version of Framework 6. The problem is that with this approach, we would have two periods in time where things break for application developers. We would have a Qt6 break and a Framework 6 break, and we sort of wanted to spare the application developers the, the second break and break everything at once. Yeah. Is that a question? Or is just stretching arms? Okay, fair enough. Anybody else feel like stretching their arms? <laughs> Let me just get my phone here, because that means that we are at a break time now. The kind of uh, breaks that is not API compatible. <laughs> so uh, after a, a short break, we have 25 minutes. For those of you that need exercise, you can go upstairs. And upstairs, you'll be learning about 25... 25 thousand stars later, how to survive maintaining a popular GitHub in your spare time. GitHub project, I guess. And down here, there's going to be community-driven QML coding guidelines. Shall we let Nico have a great hand?